Okay, so this is week five, marketing and publicity, the final week of the five-week sessions. Um, thanks for coming along for the ride, the journey for everybody that came to all five weeks. Um, so at this point, you've written a true crime um, piece, article, you, hopefully a, a book. And um, now you have this book and you have to tell the world about it. So how does marketing and publicity work with, um, with, with the publisher? How does it work with your editor and agent? That's what we'll talk about tonight. Um, and how do you begin if you don't have any experience with marketing or publicity? And uh, unfortunately, I'd say as a, as a working writer, it does tend to um, be about 40% of your, of your daily workload after a while, um, engaging on social media, things like that. And then around the time of the publication, I imagine it probably switches around to 60% marketing and publicity and 40% actually continuing to write and work creatively. Um, but if you want to be successful, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's an, it's a very important part of the whole process, unless you're in the top 0.001% that, you know, make millions a year and, and have a team to do this sort of thing, you're probably going to be doing it on your own, or with help, hopefully from the publisher. So, um, Uh, let me tell you a story right off. Uh, and this, I got some very good advice from my first publisher when we were about to go out with the Amy Mihalovic book way back in 2006. And he, you know, because I didn't have any experience with marketing and publicity at that point, and I was curious to how it worked. And what he told me is something I still think about, and that's for a reader to buy your book or for somebody to really buy anything, purchase anything, they have to come across it to see it in ads or see it however they, they, they encounter it. They have to see it seven times on average before they commit to spending the money to actually purchase it or, or to get it for themselves. So how do you get how do you how do you get that book out in front of them seven different ways seven different times um what we did regionally for amy mihalovic was they put me on a lot of radio shows out here a lot of local radio local tv uh and if somebody was listening to the radio on the way home they'd hear me and then maybe the next day they'd see me on a local tv talking about this true crime case and that's two times you know and and hopefully somebody will mention it to them and you just got to hope over the course of a month or two that they're going to encounter the story of your book somehow that many times so it's it's really daunting you know of course not everybody's like that if it if they're a true crime fan and uh, this is something they've been waiting for, they'll go for it pretty quickly. But I always keep that piece of advice in the back of my head. You know, how do you, how do you reach somebody seven times about what you're doing? Uh, now, there, if <clears throat> hopefully you found a good publisher to work with for your for your first book. Um, the publisher does have some responsibility to promote that book. And part of that, some of that is going to be in your contract that you work out through your agent and lawyer. If you have one and your editor, you'll work on that contract and sometimes you'll negotiate what they will do with marketing. Sometimes not, but the publisher should have, should want to promote the book and should have some sort of um, responsibility to do so. So um, give me just a sec. Oh, sorry. Uh, Kyle, I was picking up your audio. Just make sure you're muted for now. Um, and I'll take breaks and, you know, for questions, if you have any questions. Um, 
So here's some things that your publisher should be doing for your book in order to support your book. Some of these are very basic things that every publisher will do. So, and as we go, um, they'll get more and more unique. So every publisher should create advanced copies of your book. These copies will, will be available um, four to six months before publication. And what they'll do with some of these advanced copies is they will send them to the trades and that's Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, Kirkus, and a couple others, but those are the those are the three big ones. These are trade magazines and websites that are viewed by libraries and by book buyers at places like Barnes and Noble, um, you know the the chain bookstores, but also the independent bookstores will be keeping track of these too. And these trade journals are going to be reviewing books that don't come out to the public for another three months or so, the reason being is the book buyers have to know about them in order to figure out um, which books they want to or co order copies of in time for them to have those copies on the day of the release. So a lot uh, of that, a lot of bookstores, if you want your books in bookstores, a lot hinges on these early reviews that happen from these advanced copies that go out to trades. And what you're hoping for with these trade journals is a starred review. And uh, the, you know, and, and that's very easy for the book buyers to kind of look through the, the, the magazine and see those little stars. And they'll know that somebody with um, the people that review for those trade journals are generally anonymous. Uh, a lot of times they're anonymous because they have connections to the industry. They know what they're talking about. They, they've they worked in, in the business long enough to know what a good book is. So we can trust them to know when to put a star. And they know that this book should be more successful than the average book. So you're hoping for a starred review. Um, doesn't mean your, your book's not going to do well if you don't get one, but it certainly helps early on. Um, Libraries and, you know, like I said, libraries and bookstores are paying attention to this. And uh, sometimes if you get a really good review in those those trades, they'll boost the initial printing um, for a book, uh, or it could even trigger a second printing even before the book is um, is published. So what what we're building towards with marketing at that stage is trying to reach a critical mass. We you're trying to get a conversation going online and also behind the scenes with the book buyers, some chatter where people are talking about this book, you know, behind the scenes, they're saying, Hey, did you see this book that's coming out in three months? This looks a little different than what we're used to. I think this is going to be something. And once, once people are talking behind the scenes, it kind of gets the excitement going. And, um, it's a lot of the books that are successful are essentially are already successful before publication. Um, the publisher is also providing some advanced copies to reviewers, uh, reviewers in print, but more and more reviewers online that have popular TikToks or blogs or websites devoted to book reviews. Um, everybody's hoping for a review in the Times, a review in the Times, a favorable review. And most of the times, if there's a review in the, at that level, it will be mostly favorable. The really awful reviews are few and far between because they should be looking, especially with debut authors, it's kind of mean to attack a debut author for a very terrible book and kind of kill their career right there. You know, everybody's in the business of promoting good writing. And so most of those reviews will be positive. So you're hoping that uh, one of the reviewers at the Times likes your book from this early copy that they're given and that they get stacks every week. So 
um, you know, how do you get attention there? Sometimes it's just a luck of the draw. A lot of times it's it's who you know and who your editor knows. And do they know this reviewer personally? If they live in Manhattan, if they have an office in Union Square, most likely they do. Most likely they've bumped into them at a party or something. So that book will come across their desk and they'll know, oh, I know the editor for this book. She's she's really interesting. So I'm going to take a look at this. So it's it's all about relationships, just like anywhere else. Uh if you don't get a review in the Times, it's not gonna it's not gonna be the end of your book. It just means you have to work a little harder. Um, the publisher will also be providing uh, digital copies through mostly through a service called NetGalley that some of you may be familiar with. If you are a professional reviewer, um, you can check out. Uh, advanced copies on NetGalley, and you basically you apply for them, and the marketing department at the publisher will look to see that you're a legit reviewer, and then provide you with a free copy in exchange for a fair review. Um, let me see this question real quick. For the first printing for True Crime, any feel as to what the typical minimum amount of books printed? That's a very good question. Um, what should you expect for the first printing of a debut book? Uh, I would say, remember, um, a book is considered successful if it sells more than 5,000 copies, not in a week, but in its lifetime. Most books don't reach that 5,000 limit. Uh, 5,000 in a week would be spectacular. In fact, if you time it right, selling 5,000 copies in a week could get you on a bestseller list just, just, just from sales. So, um, how many copies should your publisher be printing? My, I will just share you some numbers that, that I know. Uh, for The Man from Primrose Lane, my first novel, it had a really decent advance. It had interest from the publisher, uh, and they printed 8,000 for the first printing. And I think that's somewhere around average. It could be more like five. Um, starting out, especially if you're a debut author, you're untested. I think it was the larger advance that kicked them up to 8,000. Now, still, that was when my agent heard about that. It kind of took the wind out of her sails, I remember, because she was expecting a much larger printing because of the large advance. And um, what another thing that a large printing will do you know, when you get up to tens of thousands of copies on that that first printing, people will take notice. You know, um, people in the industry, book buyers, uh, you know, the the reviewers, word will get around that they're doing a big printing, and that puts confidence into the system, and they'll know that oh my gosh, well, um, you know, they are they're really confident that this is going to be a good book. So sometimes it's it's the tail wagging wagging the dog, right? And you know, just because they seem to think that it's going to be a a bestseller sometimes makes it a bestseller. Uh it's 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 all smoke and mirrors at that point to some extent. Um so like I said, they'll be they'll be giving <laughs> advanced sorry about that advanced copies uh of your book through netgalley you know e, uh digital copies and these reviewers will provide early reviews on places like goodreads and their websites and social media and so a couple months before the book is out it's already kind of creating a buzz you know it's already generating let's say four or five stars um, average on Goodreads. So people that are really voracious readers will go through and they'll see, oh my gosh, that book doesn't even come out for another two months and it's already doing so well. I'm gonna have to like check that box. So I'll get a message when it's published and I'll know I can buy it right away. So you're, you're generating this interest early on and it all starts months before publication. If you wait until publication, it's it's mostly over. Um, I learned that the hard way. We'll get to that story <laughs> in a in a minute. 
Um, the publisher may also, but they're not obligated to, unless it's spelled out in the contract, they might put together a book tour for you. Um, or they'll throw a little party for the book launch at an independent bookstore. Um, or arrange some library visits for you, or um, in rare cases, advertising. Um, but uh, the book tours are more and more rare. They don't see a huge need for them. Authors tend to like them because it's it's kind of this romantic idea, right, of, that we've always had of, of a writer on a book tour. But it doesn't really happen that that often anymore. Um, there's just not, people aren't motivated to go out and sit in a bookstore and listen to an author that they've never heard of before, or, or somebody that they, you know, that, that is just starting out that isn't, isn't that, that famous. Um, it's hard to get people to get out of their house these days. I mean, look at the, look at the malls, look at the libraries. So those are fewer and, and further between, um. But you should, one thing you should prepare is um, I would, especially if you've written a true crime book, have a library talk ready to go uh, and it, it, put it together in a PowerPoint if you can with some nice visuals, but be able to talk about that case in, in a narrative way uh, in like a 45 minute to an hour uh, talk because the publisher may want to reach out to libraries near you or near where the case happened if you're writing about a case from another state and those libraries they you know they have so much funding every year that they're constantly bringing in authors and uh it's it's it for me it's been a really kind of decent side business i do especially in the fall i tend to do as many as 10 library talks and I have 45 minute or hour long presentations on Amy and Moore Murray and a couple of the other books. And um, for those library talks, you would ask for, and a lot of times you don't have to ask, the library knows how this works, so they'll offer this to you. But you should be getting between two and $300 uh, as an on, what they call an honorarium, um, two to $300 for your time. And then they will allow you to sell books after your talk. You know, you'll do a Q and A, and then you'll sit around uh, or afterwards for anybody that wants to buy the books. And for that, you should totally learn um, and understand how something like Square works, the the app. And if you sign up for Square, they'll send you a free little reader for credit cards, and you link it to your bank account. And it's all pretty easy once you get the hang of it. And that way people can pay with credit card, you know, or, you know, however, um, at the event. So there's library talks that'll help promote your book before and after. Um, your publisher will also, and, and when I say publisher, I mean their marketing and publicity team. Uh, they will also be handling um, giveaways on Goodreads and other places, but Goodreads is the biggest place. And if you're not already part of Goodreads, you should sign up tomorrow and just get a hang of, of how that works. Because once you become a published author, you'll have a nice little published authors page and you'll have a profile and where you can log in and it gives you some really cool stats right away as far as how many people are reading your book, how many copies have um, have sold, and uh, keeps track of the analytics. So it tells you how popular book your book is at any given time. So they will handle, they should, their team should handle those Goodreads giveaways. And that'll happen, I think, about two or three months before publication too, or maybe closer to publication. But ultimately, your publisher can only do so much. The, the the your publisher even if you're with a major publisher and not like a, a you know a small imprint or a smaller publisher somewhere if you like if you're like in with you know Holt or Simon Schuster FS and G um, Penguin you know Random House the the big names if even if you're at that level you got to keep in mind that their business 
is all about mitigating risk. And especially those big publishers will have maybe a dozen to 20 books that come out that month. And you're one of a dozen. Let's say you're one of a dozen. You're also, as a debut author, the most unproven. So they only their marketing and publicity people only have a certain amount of time to do what they need to do for the, all of those books. And so their time in their minds anyway, are better spent with established authors that they know it's going to be easier for them to convince reviewers to review and people um, to to like. You're the um, you're the unproven part of that, so it's 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 high risk for them to spend much time on you, which is sad because how do you make more <laughs> best selling writers? You need to grow debut authors, and it just kind of gets lost in it because everybody, you know, as as you know, you know, everybody is um, short on staff right now, especially in the publishing industry. So um, just keep that in mind. So the publisher can only do so much, and they may and they may end up doing very little for you, especially for your first first book. Um, now, that is, by the way, one, and, and I've talked about how I don't particularly uh, like or recommend large advances because you have to sell out that advance in order to be very marketable for your next book because the publishers, the first thing they're going to look at is, well, did he sell out his last advance? And if you have too high of an advance, it, it, re it could really hurt you. So, but the one way in which um, a really high advance helps is in this part of the the equation because if this publisher has already spent a lot of money on you they want to recoup that money so the higher the advance the more they're going to push that marketing and, and and publicity team to pay attention to you and to push that book and make it a bestseller so that might be one one reason to to take take the higher advance if you can um but a lot of it, a lot of this is going to fall on your shoulders. And uh, here's what you should be doing. Um, here's what I would recommend. I, everything starts about nine months out, nine months to a year from publication. The first thing you're going to do is solicit blurbs. And um, this is all about who you know. Um, and you should know, hopefully, a handful of other writers. Um, you should make a point to get to meet them if you can through conventions or through, you know, promoting their book on social media, saying something nice about it on um, TikTok or, or Twitter and getting them to follow you that way, because eventually you, you're going to, your publisher is going to ask you for blurbs. And what those are, are other authors saying good things about your book that they can then put on the cover of your book, you know, the usually the back cover, that they can get early enough to put it in those advanced copies to get people excited about it. So um, things like, you know, this is the best thriller I've read all year, or, you know, this this writer really knows what they're doing as, as far as research, but, you know, worded better, of course. And uh, so what, I, and, and you have to, as a working writer, especially if you're going to write multiple books, you should be aware of how this works. And it's kind of a scratch your back, I'll scratch yours type of thing. Um, yeah, can everybody, I guess there's a question. Can everybody hear me okay? Can anybody not hear me? I think so. Um, okay, good. Great. Uh, where was I? So, oh, yes. Um, People will constantly solicit authors for blurbs. And once you become published, people will come to you and say, hey, can you, um, can you write me uh, a blurb for this next book? And you should do as many of those as you can as a, as a favor, but also you're, you're making relationships there. Um, I, what I do is, you know, People constantly send me, um, uh, and, and these usually come from the editors uh, that are editing these books, um, but some come directly from the writers, and they'll say, hey, can you write a blurb for this book? Nine times out of 10, I will, 
Um, the only times I, I I won't is if on the rare occasion that that it's just it's just terrible, um, and you don't want your name associated with that book. There was one. One came in just a couple of weeks ago, and it was uh, a weird amalgamation of true crime and fiction. Now, I love the idea that they had. I would love it as a novel, and I would love it as pure nonfiction. But what they did was they took a real true crime case and kind of wondered and presented what they believed happened. And I don't like how that kind of blurs the line you should do one or the other and you can do great creative nonfiction and have it read like a novel but again it has to be 100 percent accurate or at least as, nobody's going to be 100 percent as close as you can you, you're not making anything up um so i passed on that but nine times out of ten i'll write a blurb and um actually that's how i got my latest publisher that that is now the publisher of my next three books uh, she came to me and asked me to write a blurb for a book um, about the, do you remember that case um, with the woman in the elevator in California um, whose body was found in the water tower above the hotel um, and people thought she kind of looked possessed. Um, and uh, But I really liked the book. It was a great book um, and I wrote a nice blurb for it. And that is that gave me kind of a relationship with the editor. And so when I had this this new book that's coming out in June about the Lisa Pruitt case, and we were looking for publishers and editors, I remembered her and I thought, hey, um, you know, let's send the book to her too. And uh, and she became my my new editor. So you're you're doing favors, but it's it's gonna help you out in the long run too. It's it's kind of a pay it forward type of thing. So that's how blurbs work. Um, also, you should have what you should have about nine months out before uh, publication, if you don't already, is a professional website. And if you can't, um, yes, it's on the Elisa Lamb case. There is a book. Uh, I have it around here somewhere. I think the author is last name is Anderson. But yeah, look it up. Um, it's really good. So. Uh, this website. If you don't have enough money to pay somebody to create a professional looking website for you, it's actually not that hard to do on your own. And I kind of, I taught myself and, and uh, you know, how to, how to put it all together. Uh, I recommend WordPress. You know, you can get any sort of URL, you know, I have jamesrenner.com. And so you've got that, you've got that landing site and you've got the web the website then you build a page that parks on that website and um i use the wordpress templates and it's it's free you know unless you want to go crazy with it but it's always so the free versions always worked for me and it's easy to edit and there are youtube tu tutorials to walk you through the whole process and um you know, a couple hours and you'll have a, a really nice looking website for people to find you. And you can keep it very simple. You know, here's here's a, a page for the book. Uh, here's a biography on, on who I am and what I do. And here's how to contact me or or how to contact my agent. But you want that that website already prior to publication. Um, and by that time, you're probably going to have a you know, uh, you'll probably have a version of the cover that you can put up on your website and, you know, high res, big as it can be for people to see. And you're going to be sharing that on, on social media too. And let's talk about social media real quick, because it's a big part of, of, of publicity for your book. Uh, you should have a, a social media presence. Um, I wish it wasn't so, um, uh, I think social media is one of those inventions that we should have, uh, we should like uninvent like the atomic bomb or something, but it, it's a necessary evil at this point. And so you should have a presence uh, on all, all the major social media platforms. And, you know, I'm talking about Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Reddit. 
and let's go over each one and how 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 you sh how you can use them and what I what I typically use them for because each one serves a slightly different purpose. Um, Twitter it's very good for regular engagement. You know you can a lot of times you know the really successful people on Twitter who are authors they almost like post stream of consciousness things um, where, you know, they have a thought, you know, they, they, they tweet it out real quick and people just get to know them that way. They're sharing their, their thoughts and, and ideas and you know, try to make it germane to, you know, publishing or, or true crime, but you don't have to, you know, it's just a way for people to get to know you. Twitter is something that, that takes two seconds and you can update several times a day and nobody gets annoyed about it. Uh, another way that you should be using Twitter is to follow other writers and editors and reviewers and people in the business because they'll see that follow. They'll at least take a moment most times to look at who you are and maybe they see your debut author and the reviewer will um, sometimes follow you back and then you've got the connection over, over DM if you want it. Um, hang on. Oh, let me let me jump to Alexa's question here. Over the years, I've created all these accounts for personal use. Would it be beneficial to create new accounts that are more professional? Honestly, I don't think so. Um, I would keep the personal uh, account. Uh, the The personal connection is is what I think engages with people, and um, you know, it's a little tricky with true crime. And I kind of go back and forth. You know, you can get too personal. Um, I. You know, I, I don't post as much about my kids as I used to, but on Instagram, I still occasionally share pictures of my family, but I used to share them, you know, across the board. And, um, you know, with true crime, you get kind of creepy people and stalkers. And so you got to pull back a little bit and figure out what the balance is. But I would try to keep it personal as much as possible. Um, back to Twitter real quick, you're following writers and editors. One of the things that Twitter does is, of course, your feed. The other accounts you're seeing are mostly accounts that you personally follow. And if you can be and if you can um, make those connections with other people in the industry, the writers and editors and reviewers and try and eventually you'll get some of them to follow you back. And then you'll end up on the suggested tab for the rest of them that say, hey, you follow these people. Maybe you should be following, you know, James Renner too. And uh, what that does is park, eventually it parks you inside the echo chamber that you want to be in, which is the publishing echo chamber um, in which everybody thinks they're uh, kind of a, a big deal because um, they think that that's the world and you kind of lose the perspective that, everybody else outside of that echo chamber still doesn't really know who you are. But um, the people that are making those decisions and buying the books and doing the reviews, they'll know you by then. Uh, Facebook, I found is very good for uh, building a, uh, a loyal fan base. Um, you know, the average, <clears throat> the average reader of true crime um, happens to be uh, women of a certain age. Uh, and they are also one of the uh, <laughs> the biggest demographics. Um, did I did I put that right, Val? I think I, you know, respectfully, you know, I I've seen the polls. So but they're also a big presence on uh, on Facebook. And so um, it just works very well. Uh, they're the ones that are engaging in Facebook and they happen to be the same demographic as, as most of your readers are going to be. So um, I found it very helpful, helpful to build a fan base through Facebook. Uh, with Facebook, it's different from Twitter because if you're posting every 10 minutes or every half hour, people get annoyed with that and they're not seeing it all because of the way the feed works. So on Facebook, I only update once a day or maybe once every other day. Uh, you don't have to be so constant with, with Facebook. Um, you should also be using Facebook to join pages of other authors, uh, follow and like what they're doing, if in fact that you like what they're doing, um, and, uh, and, and build it that way. Um, Instagram, 
is a place that's really good for showing your um your human side you know it's showing you as a as a as a real person so you're sharing um you know pictures of you out on your adventures you know where you're going to interview somebody or a new cover of your book or uh your travels to bookstores your visits to everything you're doing to, with the with this book where you're meeting people like independent bookstores or libraries you're taking a photo there make sure you take a photo and then you upload it on instagram you tag those places and and you know they'll take notice of that and and like you for um taking the time to mention them and uh so i, I you know instagram's kind of a fun one um tiktok is bit it gets bigger and bigger every month um, it's the best algorithm for what you want to do and for getting your book out there. It's it's because it's it's open and Facebook, the algorithm is um, and Twitter to some extent, the algorithm is um, clamped by the capitalist drive to make money. So if you are, it will pick up on the fact that you're trying to promote a book. And it will try to sell you a boost or a better way to engage because it wants you to spend twenty dollars to reach a thousand more people. It's not going to just it's it it could just give your feed to those thousand people, but then it wouldn't make any money. TikTok's a little different because it's run by um, communist China, and uh, I and for that reason I'm not exactly sure that it's going to be around uh, forever, but. Um, the algorithm is essentially free. And what it's promoting is an addiction, an addiction to the app itself. And uh, you can you can tap into that. And uh, you know, you're going to post content about your book. If it's a true crime, say if it's a true crime case, a murder, you can you can post. 30 second snippets of here's a new fact in the case. Here's a new clue I found. Um, did you know this about the case? Or just simply walk through the, the very basic facts of the case in 10 different videos. And using those hashtags on TikTok is very important. You're going to find out what hashtags are trending with true crime. Put those in there and people that are interested in your topic will find it it will push it to those people because it wants those people never to put down tiktok um so it's it's pretty wild so i, I would check that out it's also very fickle so <clears throat> um your content has to be constant and engaging and good and if it's not then you know it goes to the bottom of of the bin pretty quickly um, Goodreads is essential. If you're not on Goodreads already, you should be. Um, that's uh, something you should be in, you know, tomorrow. It's the very best way to meet voracious readers. People that read 10 books a month um, are going to be hunting for new content that, and, and they're going to be looking for Goodreads for that content. Um, very important here on Goodreads to keep track of people who are reviewing your book. And if, and if you tend to make this, a, if you if you want to make this a career and have multiple books, you're going to want to go to your last book uh, page on Goodreads and, and look to see whose reviews are the most popular. Some of those reviews, some of the reviewers have fans. Some of the reviewers have, you know, when they post a review, a thousand people will read it because they love that reviewer because they use, they're so well at articulating what's good about the book. And they use these visuals and GIFs, and um, it's just really fun to read. And so if you can find a handful of them, they are invaluable. And you'll want to reach out and make friends with them because on your next book, you're going to give them one of those digital copies of your book for free so that um, they, you know they like your stuff already. They're going to read it two or three months before the public does, and they're going to put up this wonderful review on Goodreads for it. And that's going to be the first thing that somebody finds when they're searching and wondering what your book's about. They're going to be like, let me see if this is any good. 
you already know that there's this wonderful review for it. So um, Goodreads is 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 wonderful for that. Um, on good one one little caveat on Goodreads that definitely keep this in mind. <clears throat> um, the way I explained it is a good way to engage with these reviewers. What you don't want to do is just have like a cut and paste thing about your book that you spam a hundred reviewers with because they will pick on that pick up on that really quickly and and after like a couple strikes you will lose your page so don't spam people try to make legitimate connections with a couple of these top reviewers um and finally reddit uh, if you're not on reddit you should understand what it is um, it, I would suggest a YouTube tutorial, just a real quick uh, understanding of how to use Reddit and, and how it works. Um, find a couple subreddits. The ones for true crime that are really decent uh, are Unresolved Mysteries, the Unresolved Mysteries sub. Um, and a couple, I don't know, the other ones are kind of, the, the Unresolved Mysteries has has good moderation. The other ones it's hit or miss, but there's there's an unresolved mystery for just true crime, true crime podcasts, really any any flavor. And um, you got to be real careful with, uh, they don't allow self-promotion on a lot of these subs, but again, you're also commenting on other people's, uh, uh, on these, these cases and true crime, and you're making a name for yourself out there. I use my real name on Reddit. Um, a lot of people go, try to go completely anonymous on Reddit. Uh, but I don't see how that benefits you as a writer. And, you know, so I just, I use my real name, always have. Um, you Why you can't do self-promotion on Reddit. There's one exception that's very helpful for a book I found is um, an AMA, which is, which stands for Ask Me Anything. And if you reach out to the mods and, and the moderators and you're nice about it, um, and you have a book with a traditional publisher, they could allow you to do an AMA on the date of the release. And so that morning, there'll be a post for everybody that says, hey, author, you know, James Renner of this, this book uh, is going to appear for an AMA at 10 a.m. Feel free to jump in, ask him any questions you want. And that's a fun way to engage with your reader, especially if you're covering a case that uh, has been mentioned on those subreddits that people are paying attention to. They're going to really want to know the scoop and um, what you found out. So um, let's jump to six months before publication. This is when you're beginning to push pre-sales. You're getting that cover that you already have out on social media. So people are familiar with it. They're getting to recognize it. And you're asking people um, to... You know, hey, if you like this, if if you think you might be interested, um, order order it today, and you know as a as a pre sale that way you have at the moment of its release you'll get it before anybody else, because those pre sales all count towards your first week of sales, and this is all about driving up the very first week of sales for your book, because if you you know you, we don't know exactly what the threshold is for making a bestseller. But um, if you time it right, it could be um, it could be somewhere around 5,000 copies. If you time it exactly right, it could be a little fewer. Uh, if you hit it on an off week, um, and you only need to hit that bestseller list once. And then forever after that, you get to use that little tag on all your books. Um, so uh, this is all about driving up the, the pre-sales for your books. Now we're about um, three months out, and uh, here's something. This is this is interesting timing because I, I wasn't aware that too many other people did this. But here's what I like to do about three months out. I make postcards of my books, and um, actually, I think I have one. Do we have one up here? I don't. Um, but I make I make postcards of my books, and on the on the front of the the postcard is the cover, and on the back it leaves me room to to write, and I send those postcards out to um, people uh, and that I've met, um, and every bookstore, you know, specifically employees that I've met at bookstores, but 
um, independent bookstores, uh, book buyers and booksellers at Barnes and Noble. And I'll send it out to them three months before and just say, hey, um, I, you know, uh, thanks for helping me with the last book. Um, I think you might find this interesting. It comes out June 27th. And you're, you're not even specifically saying, please buy this new book. But it, you know, they, they, it's, it's for them to see this and they'll make the connection themselves and think, oh yeah, he was a, he was a cool guy. He came in he signed some copies, you know, we'll order, you know, we'll order three books or five or a case of them. Because at that point they're buying the books for the future, you know, the three months into the future. So that's about the right timing for that three months before you're sending out postcards. <clears throat> Coincidentally, I got this today. Um, in the mail. Um, I checked my post office box and it's a postcard that somebody made for their true crime book um, with uh, you know a little little bit about the book on the back. So um, other people are doing this and uh, it's it's very effective and you know you can make a hundred postcards uh, for you know I don't know like 20 bucks or something. So it's it's low risk high reward. Um, you're also reaching out to everybody you know uh, that likes you. So don't be afraid to post on your family, you know, Facebook page, your personal profile and say, hey, you know, guys, uh, you know, I wrote this book. It'd be super cool if you bought a copy. Um, if you don't like it, use it to like make that wobbly table steady or, you know, give it to somebody that does. Uh, but, you know, it, it helps and, and feel free to share with them that like all these pre-sales Help me out with that first week, which is what makes or breaks an author. Um, go through your your emails. And look at the people that have contacted you in the last year or two, or that have reached out to you. You know any sort of connection. Um, yeah, because if you want to do this for a living, it's it's that that it's all about that first week. Um, <clears throat> so, and if this is your first book, your what your one really important thing that you need to do. Every time you meet somebody in this business, especially at bookstores um, and book buyers, you're writing down their name in libraries. Um, you're writing down their name and where you met them and where they work. And that way for your next book, you have that list already. And you just go to the list and you that's who gets the postcards. That's who gets the contacts. So um, start keeping the, that Rolodex there. Now, um, if all else fails, there's one more thing you can do, and it's kind of the ugly side of the whole business, but there's people that make a lot of money doing it, and that's you You have the option of hiring a publicist. And uh, for I'll tell you a couple stories about this. So on my first book, Primrose Lane, the novel that came out in 2012, um, I you know, it was my first big book and um, about three, uh, you know, about three months before publication, I realized that uh, my books weren't getting into the bookstores. I, I had assumed I was with a publisher that would get the books in every bookstore in the country. And I started realizing things about the industry. And one of the things I realized was that those tables where you walk into Barnes and Noble, the, the tables out front that are full of all the cool new books uh, were not constructed by the people that worked at the bookstore, but they were uh, real estate that was bought up by publishers and they would pay Barnes and Noble a certain amount to have their books displayed. And um, so I realized it's not a fair playing field. Now, to Barnes and Noble's credit, they did change that policy in the last year, and they have much more control on a on a store by store basis. So, um, but it's it can be like that to some extent. Everybody's trying to game the system a little bit, and I realized my book wasn't being talked about. Um, it wasn't being talked about online. It wasn't getting any sort of buzz. Bookstores weren't committing to it, and I was freaking out because if that book wouldn't have worked that would, I, I understood that that would be the end of my career um, at that level. I'd never get another book published. So I went to my agent and I'm like, what, what in the world can I do? 
and she said, well, you could hire a publicist. And she got me in touch with a couple and I, I interviewed them over the phone. I think I interviewed three companies. And I ended up going with the company um, just across the Hudson uh, in New Jersey. I'm trying to remember the name. Um, I think it might've been Wonderkind, something similar to that. But um, it, uh, I spoke with their publicist. They told me their game plan. And um, what they could do was uh, they could get the book in the hands of more reviewers. Um, and, uh, but also what they could do that the publisher couldn't do so well was get the books in the hands of some social uh, influencers, some some people that really weren't connected to the publishing world, but were super popular on social media that could talk about the book. Um, and, you know, if they have 50,000 followers, you know, they're, they're like, hey, this this book is kind of cool. And, um, you know, they they also offered some ideas that I wasn't hearing from the publisher that that I that I really liked, um, you know, like. Um, uh they suggested that I give along with the book um, that that I give a gift to um, a couple uh, reviewers for very popular blogs at the time. This was 2012 and blogs were still pretty cool. Um, and now when I say gifts, it doesn't mean like, you know, um, you know, some sort of you know, a uh, fancy thing, you know, like a, like a watch or, you know, a car or, you know, anything cool like that, just something to stand out that they could keep. Um, so what I did was um, my father-in-law is a pack rat and he had the, I've never seen this before, but he had a recordable eight track player and a bunch of blank eight tracks. And so I recorded myself reading the first couple chapters of Primrose Lane onto A-Track. Um, and if, if you're too young, A-Track is this bulky thing that they used to play music on in the late 70s that only lasted for a few years. And so I had an audio book and I put the little cover of my, my book on the A-Track um, kind of made it look weathered. And uh, um, I made five of these, five of these Man from Primrose Lane A tracks. Now, I was giving them away and knew that they didn't have any way to play those. So I went to um, flea markets and uh, secondhand stores around the Akron area. And I tracked down five workable A-track players that cost me like, you know, 10 bucks a piece. Um, so I shipped out to five reviewers an A-track player and my audiobook on A-track um, and asked them to review the book. And um, one of them was the guy that runs this, this website called Boing Boing, which was really hip. Um, at the time, I still read it, and uh, it's it's pretty popular. And he was so astounded by this weird thing that I sent him that he made a whole post about it. And he 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 brought out the A track, hooked it up, and played it, and it worked, and, and that got the book some attention. So um, you know, a gift means something strange that they would remember you by. Um, so uh, now with the the I've that's the only time I've used a publicist um, and I don't necessarily intend to use them again but it certainly helped for my first book they are quite expensive now um, sharing these numbers with you the advance on that first book was about 50,000 um, and I spent 10,000 on the publicist thinking that this was an investment in my future that this is going to to give me the career that I wanted and uh, hopefully assure that I will have more books to publish in the future. So I took a gamble um, and it definitely helped. Uh, so make sure when you're, if you're thinking about a publicist, if you're interviewing them, one of the big things you need to know is who are their, who are the clients they worked with before? If you haven't heard of any of them, um, go to another publicist. 
but if you if you do know the that they have a good track record, you know they have those connections, you know it'll be worth it. Um, and that's all negotiable too. They'll give you a price, and these you 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 negotiate that down. Um, you know your counter is like maybe three quarters of what they're asking. So uh, that's it's kind of a dirty part of the business. Um, now, if you can't afford a publicist, uh, it's very important that you're thinking outside the box uh, for other ideas. How to make your book stand out? How to how to how to get your book noticed? Now. Um, John Grisham, um, one of the, another thing I did with Primrose was a stock signing tour. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. But it's kind of what John Grisham did to get started. Um, Grisham uh, would drive around, this before he became super famous, he'd drive around with copies of his book in the trunk of his car. And he would drive around to bookstores around the South and say, hey, you should be carrying this book. And then he'd, he'd give them copies to sell um, and have every opportunity to, to push that book. He was like a, like a Bible salesman, but it was, it was his book out there. And eventually his book got so many places in the South, people remembered the name and, and he was a good writer too. So that helped. And uh, um, so he's out there hustling. And that's sometimes that's what you need to do. Um, so with Primrose, uh, the pub publicist helped. We were starting to get noticed, but it's still, it, my book was still not getting in enough places. Um, the, <clears throat> the week that it was published, I called up um, bookstores around the country. And like, I called up a bookstore in Alaska. I'm like, how many copies of Primrose Lane do you have? And they're like, what? I don't know what that book is. And I'd call up like Chicago and, you know, how many books do you have? And they're, they're well, well, we have two copies, um, you know, and if, if the bookstore had any copies at all, they wouldn't have that many. So I'm like, how do, how do I get my books in the bookstores? And I realized there was only one way I could guarantee that the bookstore would actually carry my book. And that was if they knew um, I was coming to sign the copies. And so, um, I did something kind of crazy. I called up um, a bunch of bookstores on the east side of the country. And I said, hey, uh, I'm just calling because I'm going to be passing through town next week. Um, if you have a couple copies of my book, I'd be happy to sign them. It's called a stock signing. You're not sitting there waiting for people to come in and sign your book. You're just going to the bookstore and signing the books. And they're like, oh, well, we don't have any copies of your book, but if, if you're coming in, we'll order a couple. And so all the bookstores ordered at least two or three copies. Some of those bookstores, when they knew that I was coming through, ordered a whole box of, of the book. So I left my house from Akron, Ohio, and I drove, I took a week off. Um, my wife gave me a week and uh, I, I drove from Akron east to Boston, down through Jacksonville, Florida, over to New Orleans, up through the middle part of the country, through Indianapolis, and then back home through Akron. I visited 55 bookstores in seven days and signed all the copies that they had. And to this day, if you go to um, Amazon, uh, uh, the analytics there, they're like Nielsen ratings to show where my copies, uh, where my, my books are being sold. You can still see that path. That's where my fans are. Um, and uh, um, my second book, I, I've kind of made a tradition of this now. My second book, I did um, uh, Seattle all the way down to San Diego, down the West Coast and visited, I think, I think that was like 35 bookstores. Um, signing copies there. So, um, and I think with the publicist and doing that stock signing is what saved the book um, because we started getting the numbers a, a week or two after publication. And even my editor at the time, she's like, well, I don't know what did it, but something saved your book. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I don't think I told her um, that I was visiting so many of those bookstores. And while I was driving, by the way, um, I ordered 
uh, giant, you can go online and you can order these giant magnets that stick to the side of your car, like the size of one of your doors. And uh, so I, I, I ordered this giant magnet that said, who, who is the man from Primrose Lane? And uh, with the website on it. And so as I'm driving, I'm this driving billboard and, you know, maybe a handful of people were like, what the hell is that? And, you know, Googled it and got a book that way. So do whatever you can to save, you know, to make your career, uh, to get those books in the bookstores. And, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with any of that because you're not, you're not selling, you're not pushing these books onto people that don't want them. You're just giving the opportunity for people to find your book. You're giving people the opportunity to, to, to see it and to decide for themselves, but you got to get the books in the bookstore somehow. Um, so after publication, uh, you're going to promote your book for at least a year <clears throat> until you get tired of it, until people get tired of it. Um, but don't give up for, for like a year. You're going to be constantly talking about the book. If you get a good review, you're putting it out on social. Um, and you're looking at conventions. Conventions are a great way to, to meet other, other people in the industry and to have people talk about your books. Um, and if you're into true crime, there's a really big convention called CrimeCon that happens every year. Um, this year it's in Orlando. And uh, they actually don't have too many book authors there, but um, you know you can make it out to to CrimeCon even if you're going out as a visitor, um, just to meet other people in the industry. But um, you know, or you could do what I did and start a podcast. Um, you know, you could make a podcast about the case that you wrote about, or a podcast in general about true crime, and you can get on uh, what they call Podcast Row at, at CrimeCon. So it gets you in the building and um, uh, in front of these people. Um, oh, cool. Gail uh, was at CrimeCon in Vegas. Um, those are always fun. Uh, did you make these trips? Alexis had a question. Did you make these trips in rental cars? Uh, <clears throat> I did not. Um, and the, the first time I did not. Uh, but that's a very good idea um, because I, I definitely wore out the engine in my vibe. Uh, by driving that many miles on the car. I should have taken a rental car. Uh, the second time I did, when I did uh, the West Coast. Um, and, and you know, this is so long ago that um, they gave me a, an issue with that. Nowadays, they wouldn't, the rental car companies don't care if you take your car from one city and turn it into another city. But it was a big deal, I remember, when I got, when I picked up the car in Seattle and, and they're like, okay, when are you going to return it? And I said, well, I'm going to return it in a week, but it's going to be in San Diego. And they're like, what? Um, so it took some convincing, but I don't think that's such a problem. Um, there is a crime con in London too. Yes, there is. In fact, I will be there this year. Um, it'll be in, uh, so Sylvia, if you're going to come to London, um, you got to say hi. I'll be there in, uh, in June. Um, there's also, if, you, if you're if you into um, writing fiction, uh, crime. Oh, cool. Um, Sylvia and I get to hang out. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, if you if you're into fiction uh, thrillers, uh, there's what's called BoucherCon uh, is the big one for that. So um, check into all those as well. Um, but that's that's it. That's pretty much it for for marketing and publicity. It's all about um, you, you know there's there's a bunch of people promoting their books. Um, so you got to figure out a way to do something a little more unique, whether it's you know, these stock signings or, you know, weird things like a track tapes, you got to figure out a way to stick, uh, stick out a little bit. Um, but uh, happy to answer any questions you, you might have, um, you know, not just about marketing and publicity, but this is the last class. So if you have questions about anything, um, you know, raise your hand or, or, uh, you know, ask away in the, in the comments.